Well, Dr. Claudette Anderson Copeland, we are just uh, thankful and appreciative that you would come and share your time and um, share all of the wisdom and experience and genius that you have. So um, most of our audience would know who you are, but there may be some who may not know who Claudette Anderson Copeland is. So why don't you tell us first um, a little bit about yourself? Well, thank you, Dr. Frank Thomas. And uh, I begin by saying I am humbled and honored and puzzled <laughs> as to this invitation to come. I am the daughter of what we called in the 50s a numbers banker mm -hmm. in the inner city of Buffalo, New York. Mm -hmm. My father disdained preachers, mm -hmm. did not trust them and thought all of them were pimps. Mm -hmm. My mother was a factory worker up from rural Georgia and I had a storied interesting upbringing mm -hmm. in my home were prostitutes and boosters. I'm not sure that your audience would know what that is. People who, who stole clothes and sold them. Mm -hmm. uh, we fed the people who came from the South. Our home was open to all sorts of people. There was never a dull moment in my home. I had lovely parents warm and uh, thinking parents, uneducated formally, but thinking people who had a wide embrace of all people. I am the girl who, whose mother and daddy knew little about church, but knew an awful lot about loving people. I was a little girl who, uh, by the age of 12, had already been sexually damaged mm. by the boys in my neighborhood. But in that breaking, put in me a hunger to be healed even as a little girl. I'm the little girl who began to, to seek Jesus, although I did not know who I was seeking. Mm. I went to church with anybody who was going. I caught a ride. Mm. And I began to look for Jesus, although I did not know it was Jesus I was looking for. Mm -hmm. So by the time I was 13-ish, adolescence, already keenly on a search for that which was larger than what I saw and had already experienced. A classmate from the sanctified church began to harass me about my salvation. Mm. I'm 13, 14 years old, and she haunted me mm -hmm. <laughs> till I finally relented and began to go with her to her storefront sanctified church. Mm -hmm. But the amazing thing was I found Jesus there. Mm -hmm. I found a real and transformational experience in the bowels of the little sanctified church that, that literally opened my whole life up and put me on a search for now not just this Jesus, but how the will of this Jesus could be realized in my life. I'm 13, 14 years old. Who am I? I have no other career. I have no other life. I've known no other way. As one of my old mentors, 
Mother Mary Ellen Goodwin, who is long gone to heaven, she said, baby, all the sin I learned, I learned in the church. <laughs> <laughs> but I've known no other life but this, this life mm -hmm. in the bowels of Mother Church. Mm -hmm. So tell me about your call to ministry. My call to ministry was, if there is such a thing, it was, it was simultaneous to my salvation, I believe. Mm -hmm. 14 years old, now thrust into the, into the, the fermenting, roiling life of the sanctified church. Immediately in this context where my elders said, there's something on your life, little girl, but God doesn't use women. Mm. God is using you, baby, but God doesn't use women. Mm -hmm. but by the time I was 15 years old, and that's the time that I, I identify the hand of the Lord so heavy upon my life that even those who were my elders and who said, God does not use women, said we have to recognize that God's hand is on your life. And so in my denominational world, women were relegated to what was called the missionary track. Mm -hmm. And so at 15, I was a young missionary who was called to do the youth revivals and who, who in the Baptist church, you would have called it your trial sermon. Mm -hmm. But at 15 years old, my quote trial sermon as a young missionary was presented to the church. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send mm -hmm. and who will go for us? Here, here am I, here am I. Mm -hmm. And I, I identify that that season in my life as the beginning of, of clearly being called forward into, I knew not what, but I knew it would be a, a lifelong yes, mm -hmm. a lifelong yes to whatever this, this, this lasso that the spirit had begun to, to urge me on by. My call to ministry was at 15 years old. Mm -hmm. So do you remember your first sermon? I just said, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying. That was the first sermon? That was my first sermon. Here am I, mm -hmm. send me. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what that meant, <laughs> yeah. but it was truly, it was truly the uh, kind of the, the directional push for the rest of my life, being sent into places that I, I had not read the fine print before I went. <laughs> that was my first, at 15 years old, on the floor of the church because of course I was not allowed into the pulpit. Right, right. And at that time, I, you know, I learned something very early that um, you know, although placement matters and symbols certainly matter and they send powerful, powerful messages to those who watch and see. I found out that, that when the hand of the Lord is on your life and your gift is authentic, I could preach from the bathroom with a mic on that I forgot to turn off <laughs> and God still moved among the people. So yeah, that was, that was my beginning story. So tell me about you mentioned one of the mentors um, in your life. Who, who were some of your mentors that helped you to, to grow in your, particularly in your preaching, but just helped you to grow and actualize your ministry? Most of my, my mentors were probably names no one would know because they were also the women, uh, the women of the sanctified world, the women of the sanctified church, the women whose names were not written and whose platforms were very small, but they made 
they made all the difference in my life. Dr. Mary Ellen Goodwin, she was the wife of a professor at ITC. By the time I was, uh, by the time I was in seminary, uh, she was the first sanctified woman that I knew who wasn't afraid of men. And that was, that was large for me, having been in an environment where we, we learned as women, we learned uh, to, to appropriately duck. We learned to appropriately edit ourselves in the presence of certain kind of men. We learned that we had to do business out in the red tent, away from the, the dangerous eyes of the men. But Mary Ellen Goodwin, well, she was my first, my first ministry mentor. She was the one that first took me into Haiti. She was the one who first began to open my eyes to the foreign field. She was the one about four feet tall and, and, and totally, um, totally unafraid. I learned from her just by her life that they might not like you, but, but they, they can't kill you. Mm -hmm. um, my preaching mother, if I were to have a preaching mother, because of course I was, I was, uh, I was worrisome to the men, but my preaching mother was a woman by the name of Ernestine Cleveland Reams. Mm -hmm. She was a, 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 a pioneer out of Oakland, California. Her dad was a great bishop in the Churches of God in Christ. Ernestine was also, um, she was, she was a, a pioneer in the, in the days of, I'm talking about the late 40s, early 50s. The first woman I saw, and I was again, I, I wasn't even saved when I first saw her. I was, I was 12 years old at that time I was looking for Jesus. And I would catch the bus from my house in Buffalo, New York, down to the corner of Clinton and Jefferson, where every year the Church of God in Christ spread a tent. Mm. And Ernestine would come through preaching I'm 12 years old, haven't even found Jesus yet, but I'm looking for him. And I see this woman who had, who had a little old black robe on and a kind of had a jerry-rigged microphone and her baby was maybe two, his legs didn't even reach the end of the seat. And when she mounted that platform, bless your name, Jesus, she would come with such power and such such clarity with this gospel that I would sit there as, as a 12, 13 year old and I watch drunk men stand on the side of the tent and they would lay their bottles down, come to the altar with tears in their eyes saying, what do I have to do? What do I have to do to know Jesus? I would watch the power upon her life, not an educated woman, not, not a scholarly woman, but a woman who had such, a, such an authentic connection to that which was the unseen, mm. that God used her life in such a way that it left such an impression on my life, I'm 12 years old. And then fast forward, I'm now, I'm now saved, I'm in the church, I, I, got, I got the Holy Ghost, God is moving on my life, and I'm hearing in this ear, but God don't use women. Some about you, little girl, maybe you can be, but God doesn't use women. And I remembered somehow I, that, that, that little lady with the, with the, the humble black robe and the, and the jerry-rigged microphone, I would remember her always on my shoulder. I remembered her, the power of God that, that arrested people. And I remember thinking, there is a lady somewhere that's preaching. Mm -hmm. I remember meeting her years ago. She always stayed on my shoulder. I'm 15, 16 years old then, looking for mentors. Fast forward, I'm out of seminary. I'm in my 20s. Every door is shut. There was, there was, there was no such a thing as a job or... And Mary Goodwin, my seminary professor's wife, said to Ernestine, who happened to be her friend, fast mm -hmm. forward, fast forward, we're talking, 10, 15 years. She says, I want you to meet a little old gal by the name of Claudette. God's going to use her life. Ernestine was the first person who set me on a national platform that 
believe that my ministry was worth somebody hearing. Mm -hmm. I guess, so if I talk about any mentors in my life, Mary Ellen Goodwin, Dr. Mary Ellen Goodwin and Pastor Ernestine Cleveland Reams were the two who saw something in my life and who were not afraid of the men mm -hmm. and who began to situate me in a place where, where my voice could be heard mm -hmm. and that, that believed in the validity of what God was doing in my life. So how did, how did you get to seminary? I was at the University of Connecticut planning to be a physician. I wanted to be a doctor. I believed that I was going to be a physician, perhaps because I had spent so much of my childhood in and out of hospitals. Mm -hmm. I, I, had, I had become enamored with those physicians who cut and excavated my body and healed me until the next time. Mm -hmm. When I graduated from uh, the University of Connecticut, my, my fiance then, David, was at Colgate Divinity. He's a year ahead of me. And we both now out of the little sanctified church looking for a future. He's at Colgate and I came home for, for the summer and he said, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a man by the name of Dr. Leonard Lovett and he's, he's the Church of God in Christ uh, founding dean of the seminary in Atlanta. And they're looking for Kojic students that want to go to seminary. And I said, oh, that's great. What's a seminary? <laughs> <laughs> It was then that uh, Dr. Lovett, Dr. Leonard Lovett, who I believe now is still alive in Southern California somewhere, he began to sit in the car with us one night over summer vacation. I was a senior, David was already at Colgate, and he began to cast a vision of Camelot. Mm -hmm. The Church of God in Christ is getting ready to enter its most transformative stage. They're looking for both trained and spirit-filled young men and women to carry the church on to its next dimension of great, greatness and grandeur. And I'm saying, yeah, I'm, I'm your girl, I'm your girl, I'm your girl. So it was that year that, that Dr. Lovett introduced us to the ITC, C.H. Mason Seminary, and David, David gave up his, his cold gay scholarship. Mm -hmm. And he and I went together to the ITC, newly married, 21, 22 years old, and there began our, our quest for, for theological training and there began to open our world. Mm -hmm. So what was your favorite um, area in seminary? I don't know that I had a favorite area. I, I think that seminary itself, for someone like me who sat in the church every Sunday and heard the stories of Jesus, but who was always hungry to find out, but there's something behind that story, who read the Bible and who memorized the texts and, and who heard the preaching, but who, somebody like me who was always curious to know, uh, there's gotta be more to it than this. So to sit in my first seminary classes and, and hear Dr., Dr. Briggs talk about New Testament exegesis and to find out the story behind the story, I left class every day with my mouth open, like good God Almighty. Mm -hmm. So the whole seminary experience for me was just transformative. It was, it was just, it, it was God's gift to my life. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up uh, morphing into pastoral care because remember, I told you at 11, 12 years old, I'm already damaged learned how to, as they say in athletics, learned how to play hurt. But I began also to gravitate toward pastoral care, not knowing that I was trying to heal myself. Mm -hmm. So seminary and uh, pastoral care and then clinical pastoral education, which was just transformative for me. If I had to say that something was my favorite, it was that, it was that area of of both excavation, that area of uh, courageously looking at truth about myself that had been tucked away, uh, prohibited. Mm -hmm. 
and which also set me on a, a, a preaching trajectory, mm -hmm. which, which was always grounded in the care of souls, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. care of lives. Mm -hmm. So tell me more about that, because you know, I want to ask you about your preaching methodology. You, you know, you, how do you put a sermon together? But really more important than, than, than just that, What's at the heart of your preaching? If I had to describe uh, how I preach and how I have entered preaching moments my whole life, I think it would be the imagery of casting a net into the ocean. Before every preaching moment, before, in, every, in every preparatory uh, hour, it would be casting a wide net into the deep and then plumbing, plumbing the spirit. This, this, is, this, is, this is not something that I can explain theologically perhaps, but, but I, I've always, it, for me the preaching is not difficult, it's the preparation to preach. Mm -hmm. to, take the, to take the net and plumb it down into the deep. And then to see, so what is the Spirit saying about this context, this, this waiting congregation, this what is, what is the Spirit saying about what is necessary for this, this time and this unduplicatable moment? Mm -hmm. Preaching for me is, the difficulty of preaching is to hear, to hear. I, 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 I'm not, I'm not Pentecostal in the small way, mm -hmm. but Pentecostal in the large way in that I am shopping the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And for me then, when we have shopped the Spirit, preaching for me then is incarnational. Mm -hmm. That I am able to operate doing business with this congregation or this waiting, this waiting group of people because there has been an incarnation mm -hmm. of what the Spirit has been so kind and gracious to drop into to my soul, to my mind. Technically, yeah, technically, I, I think uh, one of the things, I think you and, and Jeremiah or, or one of your interviews, I, I did not know that methodologic, method, methodologically, I think when I preach, I usually am looking at disarming the audience, disarming the argument first. Is it Hegelian? <laughs> It works, whatever it is. <laughs> we, don't, we don't go to that name, but it works. Disarming, admitting, admitting the antithesis of what I'm about to say. Okay. Yeah. Admitting that, that I know there is an argument against what I'm getting ready to say. I, I know this probably cuts across the grain of your own truth, and I get that. But let me tell you now what Jesus says. Mm. Let me tell you now what, what possibility there is that there is a higher truth in your own argument or your own injury or your own, your own resistance. I get it, I get it, because incarnationally I've been there too. I'm, I'm, I'm hurt too, I'm, I'm disappointed too. Uh, uh, the world has disappointed me too, all of that. But now, mm. let's listen for the spirit and the text and, and the truths that predate our own injuries. Mm -hmm. Let's listen for the possibilities that there is good news. I don't know if you call that a preaching method or not, but I think that's what I do. Mm -hmm. I, um, you know, I said to you in several of our, our conversations that um, 
you really are an example or a living legend to a whole lot of preachers, and not just women, especially to women, but also as some of us as men, because I do very much experience your preaching as searching, as deep, uh, everything that, that you've said. So what would you say to uh, young preachers, male and female? I want you to start, maybe if you'd like, particularly with the female preacher, young preachers that are female, and then on to the young male preachers. Dr. Isaac R. Clark, who was my preaching professor at the ITC, mm -hmm. shaped my thinking about preaching and my living about preaching because he said to me every time we were together that more than doing preaching, the thing you got to stay on top of is the being mm -hmm. of preaching. Whenever I'm watching a preacher or listening to a preacher or perhaps mentoring in some way a young preacher, my, my conscious and subconscious examination is, who are you? Beside your use of the text and your, your, your generosity of, of, of theological information and your, your use of the vocabulary and all that's wonderful, but I'm knocking to see, is there hollowness there? Mm -hmm. Is there substance in you? Is there authenticity in you? Have you been broken? Mm -hmm. Are you really available? Mm -hmm. So, so my question to a young preacher, male or female, first of all, is let's, let's plumb behind your, your facade. Let's, let's plumb behind your, your theatrical preparation. And all that's good, I'm not knocking it. But, but if I reach in there, is it, can, can I grab hold of anything? that is substantive, that is not um, just for the stage. Who are you? Mm. How have you used your injuries? Mm. Who do you love? Where, where, are your, where are your blind spots, baby? And do you have enough humility to let's, let's perhaps look at those? Mm. That's not a gender issue. Mm -hmm. Except I have found, no offense to the brethren, but I have found that the sisters have often been a little more available mm -hmm. to that kind of examination and dialogue. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little less resistance, resistant to, to mirrors. Mm -hmm. What, what conversations do I have with young women preachers? I wrote an article one time for, for the journal. Mm -hmm. African American Pulpit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Preaching in the key of F, mm -hmm. the key of femininity. That our femininity is of such great value, such great uh, underpinning to all that we say and do, the use of our bodies. And what, what, a, what a tragedy to trade that in to try to model after some notion of male mentors and male preachers. What a tragedy. To bring your femininity to your preaching, to bring, to bring the, em the embodiment of both that which is spiritual and physical, uh, to bring the blessings of the, of the breast and the womb and the experience of womanhood. And when presented healthily, when presented healthily, you know that you don't, you don't have to use that as some kind of uh, stage bait. Who are you? 
how have you genuinely utilized the substance of your own soul and life? How has the incarnational power of the spirit stirred that up like good butter and flour and sugar and milk mm. so that the cake you offer is really good cake? <laughs> To the brethren, frankly, I don't know, I think if there has been any mentoring of the brethren, it has probably been siphoned and stolen from me because they don't, they, they're, they don't ask me much, you know. Mm -hmm. Maybe they learn whatever they can learn from observation two or three steps distant. But through the years, the brethren have not, not utilized me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So perhaps their learning from me has, has been something they would have to tell me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me um, your most difficult preaching moment. I, uh, I, I again, I am, I am an interiorist. Uh, I, I understand that, that social justice and and addressing systems uh, and, and addressing power and all that is part of what we do. Justice is love in action and on display. I have, uh, I have however, chosen to, been called to look at the first part of that clause so that the second part can be done well, love that can be translated to good work. So I'm saying that I'm, I'm, I'm a very much an interiorist preacher. I am very much a contemplative, truth, truthfully. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm, I'm always touching and massaging that interior space in my, in my directional preaching. This last year, there, was, there were twins born in my church. They were born about three years ago with uh, profound birth problems. And last year, I had to bury one of those twins. Zoe had died. She was two and a half, three years old. And Rewind, because you see, I'm a woman who has been married 43 years, and one of my, my soul injuries was that, that I was never able to bear children. So, to, to have to continually revisit in my own life the, the soul injuries. And because my heart stays open in my preaching, I, I, I do more than sermonically resonate, but I, I emotionally resonate. And to, to bury Zoe, somehow, somehow, took me back to all of the injustices of my universe and all the, the, the disappointments with God that everybody on that, on that family pew and everybody in my, in my, my historical space and somehow in my 60s having thought that I've kind of arranged all that well and neatly into the drawer perhaps at this time of life, to bury Zoe pulled up in me all of the ways in which I have had to defend God when I didn't believe it. When I had to act as the The defense attorney, when I'm saying sometime, you know, I think my client is guilty. Mm -hmm. And then before I came here 30 days ago, Zoe's twin died. Mm -hmm. 
one year later. Mm. Those recurring child issues make, make my sermonizing somehow to me feel a bit inauthentic. I don't know that you could say, you know, this sermon was the hardest, but, but that's one of the things because it, it connects me to, to my, own, uh, my own faith battles mm -hmm. after preaching all these years. So what did you preach? God's loudspeaker was the name of the sermon and the lessons in which a suffering and dead baby somehow speaks to us in ways that we have not been accustomed to listening to. One, one, one sermonic time, I, I was on a very large platform, well-known, quote, women's conference, and, and I was, I thought, so well-prepared, and I'm getting ready to preach. And I, I got to the pulpit, probably, probably 40,000 women sitting out there. I don't know if you've had this experience, but I opened my Bible and Jesus left the room. <laughs> he just <laughs> left the room. <laughs> just left the room. And for the next 35, 40 minutes, I was there trying to, trying to, it was literally like Jesus just left the room. I got a sermon here. I got all these people out here waiting. And somehow, Jesus left the room. <laughs> it did not matter. It did not matter what was on that paper, on that <laughs> iPad. Jesus pulled a trick on me. <laughs> so the difficulty in having to preach when the inspiration leaves and everything on that paper might as well be Chinese mm -hmm. because it, it just did not work. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the sermon itself. It was the sermonic moment particularly for one who is so dependent upon the Spirit's dialogue to bless what is written on the paper. Mm -hmm. Had a few of those moments, mm -hmm. praise the Lord, but you just say, well, I hope they invite me back next year because <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't it. You know? <laughs> so, of course, you know, I know how modest and how humble you are, so I'm going to ask you because I want you to tell me, um, when was the time when you thought you were your most effective, that it, the Lord really used you and you really got the message across. So go to the other side for me. Usually it's, it's those Sunday mornings at the New Creation Church, not necessarily on great guest platforms in places that I'm invited to preach, but those Sunday mornings when the study and the Spirit, even if there is no visible soul fishing that, you know, yields scores of people at the altar. It's, it's, it's in the dailiness of being faithful to my craft and my calling. Mm. When the eyes and the hearts of the people on the pews where I serve mm -hmm. have been opened to an ongoing move of God in their lives. I, I can't really count to myself. We've had great, great opportunities, great preaching platforms. And, and I have left those platforms with some measure of gratitude that I believe the Lord was present. Mm -hmm. And I believe someone's heart was inscribed upon. Mm -hmm. I think that the, um, one of the blessings, I was, I was somewhere lately, and for people to come to me and say, Dr. Copeland, I remember what you preached in 1979 mm -hmm. in Atlanta at such and such a meeting. Dr. Copeland, I remember in 1982 when you preached such and such, and it was that day that I received my call to ministry. Mm -hmm. I remember when you preached, and they'll name the sermon, mm -hmm. 
Mm. And they'll name the text. And it was 30 years ago. Mm. Those are the moments that I say, wow, okay, yeah, mm. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that, yeah, okay. I was, I was, that was okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So talk to me about the difference on, you know, the preaching as a pastor. You know, you've alluded some to that and preaching on the many stages and for guest preachers, evangelists. Is there, what is it about home as a pastor, as a everyday pastor preaching to people that makes it be your, some of your greatest moments? I think it is the connectional, the connectional human dimension where, where you know at home when there's, when there, cause, cause I, I've, I, I know you just got a jail and I know your family's in distress and I know we just paid your rent. So, and, and now I've begun to see the, the cumulative effect of the gospel in your life over, over the relational years that has given me confidence that this gospel works. So that when I leave them 12, 1500 people at home and go to the, the stages where there are thousands, it's those, as the old people say, it's Aunt Jane and them who gave me confidence that the scalpel that worked to, to, to open their hearts is the same scalpel that's sharp enough to work on any other arena in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know that, I don't think I'm different as a pastor versus the evangelist. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm different qualitatively or motivationally because it is, it is the, the reliability of the gospel that I've seen work in small places where there were no cameras mm -hmm. and there were no, there were no, you know, people to impress that the continuity of the relationship with these people whose lives I've seen changed. It says, okay, yeah, well, this, this thing, this, this gun works. <laughs> And then it'll shoot any bullseye no matter where, whether we're in Kenya or whether we're in South Africa, whether we're in the Caribbean, whether we're on the big platforms of the quote mega evangelists or whether we're down the street at your church. The word of God, the story of Jesus has reliably proven itself in the private spaces of my own ministry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm not here not here worrying about this thing. Mm -hmm. This gospel mm -hmm. has proven itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me about, you know, co-pastoring uh, New Creation and how has, um, you've mentioned some of it just now that, that helped you build esteem. And so tell me a little bit about the move to co-pastoring and tell me a little bit about preaching there and the support of your husband. And so tell me about you know, of course, I've been there, so I know some about the church, but many of our viewers may not know much about new creation. So tell, let's talk about it. Well, we did not, we, we, we began as military chaplains. Okay. We were the first, quote, African-American clergy couple in the military. Uh, and we were commissioned to get, well, no, we were commissioned in the same season as uh, military chaplains, again, 1970s, I'm, I'm an ordained woman with, with all these degrees and I'm looking around and doors were non-existent. Mm -hmm. The invitation to come to the military chaplaincy was because they said we have, we have thousands of families who have no pastor. So I, David first was commissioned and then I was subsequently commissioned after fighting with my wonderful denomination about ordination. Uh, we served together in a couple of military installations and really, you know, ha the, the ability to be prophetic in Caesar's household 
is something that, will, that must always be negotiated, particularly when Caesar's paying your salary. Mm -hmm. We got out and we planted that church there in San Antonio, Texas, 32 years ago now. Mm -hmm. And all along, it's been us. It's been kind of like uh, Ella and Henry Mitchell, you know, mm -hmm. it was, we used, we've just always done this together. We planted the church uh, in the early 80s, and uh, it has been both marvelous and awful. Mm -hmm. People ask, sometimes young couples particularly ask, we want to do this clergy couple thing. How does it work? And I, like Forrest Gump, say, run, <laughs> Forrest, run, run. <laughs> because it takes a particular grace. Ministry can be lethal to your marriage. Marriage can be complicating to your ministry. But through the years, one thing I must say about David Copeland, he has always covered me from the meanness of the brethren and sometime at a great cost to his own life. Now, because remember, now we're not talking about 2005 and 2010. We're talking about the early 70s. Mm -hmm. We're talking about being with a woman who at 15 has already been, been applauded and been um, positioned even in the contradictions of it all. And sometimes he has, he has taken bruises and blows from the brethren for choosing to be a feminist, to uh, cover me from their unkindness and to applaud and to help me to be positioned in places sometime that he was not invited. Mm -hmm. But he has been my, he has been my hero. Mm -hmm. And as we end, as we go now into this, I say the autumn of life, um, I must say that I have to tip my hat because had it not been for him, my journey would have been much more difficult mm -hmm. and my scars would have been deeper and my wounds might not have been recoverable. You remember this is the time when I walk in church, 70s, 80s, no matter who's preaching and no matter what the occasion is, the sermonic detour always took place. I walk in church and another thing, you know, God don't use women <laughs> and another thing, if there's two roosters crowing in the barnyard, one of them need to be beheaded. I mean, this is, this is the whole ethos of that time of life. So had it not been for, for that rooster that guarded my eggs, my, my, my ministry probably would have never been as, as um, free, from, free from toil. As it, has, as it has been. Mm -hmm. So we have a great church. We've, we've, we've toiled and we've built and we've planted and it's been a great, a, a great um, environment. It is quote apostolic in its philosophy in terms of, of, of bringing up young gifts and sending them out, grooming young gifts and, and encouraging them to go uh, and as we have been a, quote, childless couple, it has been our joy to watch what, what is affectionately called sons and daughters in ministry, to see them now doing such marvelous work in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think our, our viewers would be interested in your uh, sermon preparation process. So how do you go from Zero to a sermon, how do you, how do you prepare? I am, I am deeply wedded to prayer. I'm deeply dependent on prayer. I'm, I'm deeply uh, bound to that, that door where I, I got to keep my ear till I can hear something on the other side of the door. And once that seminal uh, idea mm -hmm. drops into my spirit, once that, that, that seminal whisper 
drops into my, my mind. Then, then I'm, I'm at the desk. The preaching may be entered from, from different doors, but for me, the difficulty is, and the joy is hearing that seminal whisper. So then I'm, I'm at, at the desk, there's, there's the Bibles open, you know, there's the, the, uh, the butter and the sugar and the eggs and the nutmeg, and I, I sit with it. I, I sit with it. I sit with. I sit with. I, I know. I know the the Lord has said that there's a there's a real need for pound cake today. There's a real need for pound cake. So how today are we going to put this together? How today is this going to? satisfy that which is most fundamental on your pew today. So sometime, you know, sometime I, I got I to gotta, I gotta deal with, okay, let's, well, let's go to that old Greek lexicon and let's see what, what does the real behind, what is, what is the word behind the pound cake? Sometime it is um, life led. And most of my preaching, I, I guess if somebody were to examine it, most of my preaching is probably more life-led than text-led. Mm -hmm. I don't mean eisegetical, I hope, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but because for me it's this thing here mm -hmm. that God is after and that God occupies and that, that most often catches the attention of the hearer from down here. Uh, with the ingredients on my table, I'm listening for how now do I feed and what, what, will, what will be the thing that will touch the appetite of this, this hearer, this, this broken person, this searching person. Um, so I begin that way. I, and I, and I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I, I would not get good grades in your class. <laughs> Pretty sure that I would not get good grades in your class because often it is so life-led. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But I pray that, that once I have mixed that butter and that sugar and stuff together from life and from the texts, that it does, that it does come together in, in, in a, in a a nurturing meal for the hearer, that it is not just motivational speaking, right. but that it somehow does, does speak and that the life of Jesus incarnates into those, those, those textual excavations and those stories that meet the believer or the unbeliever mm -hmm. on my pew. Do you have a favorite sermon in all the years of your preaching? Do you have a favorite sermon or maybe one or two favorite sermons that you'd like to be remembered by? And I know that, you know, we talk about this question of legacy. So, you know, you have a tremendous legacy and we, we're preserving that legacy and spreading it. And so do you have two, one or two or maybe one, I don't know, just across the years that our favorites for you? There was a sermon that I've, I've preached through the years called The Potter's Prerogative. Mm. Romans 9, 20, Shall this thing formed say to mm. the one who formed it, say, why did you make me like this? Mm. I have preached it with many, other, many, many faces on the label, but because it has probably been the story of my life and the life of so many others, that I would not have chosen to be made this way. And I have talked back to God, as the text says, so many days. Mm -hmm. But it has been the ongoing story of my making and probably so many that, that mirror the ways that we have been dug out. Mm -hmm. 
like clay. Mm. The ways in which the world ignored the fundamental reality of that we were down there under the backwater, but that a potter came and dug us out mm. and began to deal with the raw material. Mm -hmm. The potter who came and washed off the visible twigs and impurities, mm. but kept working with us. My own life, my great, my great, my great love for God and my great belief in the story of Jesus is because I've now learned about the sovereignty of the potter. Mm. I don't know why you made me like this. I don't know, I don't know why you, why did you, why did you cause me to, to suffer the things that I've suffered? Why? I ain't had no daddy for no preacher, no mama. I ain't, what about this church? I, I want to go home and have five babies and have grandchildren and grow my garden. I didn't want to have to take the meanness of people and all of that and then start to love the people who were mean. Ah! But it has been the potter's prerogative. Mm. And now on this side of my life, if there is any beauty at all, if there is any, if there is any express result of it, I've learned to look back and say, who was I to talk back to God? Mm -hmm. It's a sermon that I've preached through my whole life. Depending on where you were, it had a different title. <laughs> but it was the unfolding of our making. Mm -hmm. So you told me that you were retiring. So let's talk. What's the, tell me about the retirement and tell me about the ministry that's been birthed out of the retirement. Well, technically, I am going to emeritus status. Okay. Technically. Mm -hmm. Retirement means I'm disappearing. I'm not going to disappear. Okay. But I'm moving from my seat as pastor of the New Creation Church. Mm -hmm. uh, I will still, you know, uh, I'll still be around. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> I am seeing and, and I have nurtured in my belly for so many years a healing space, a sacred space for women to come and do healing work. I will be, uh, I will be opening a women's wellness center there in my, in my neighborhood where we can, we can invite women to come because healing takes time. It takes talk and the ability to tell the truth. It takes touch and, and, and body work. Mm -hmm. It takes teaching about how to get well. I am right now in negotiation and uh, traction <laughs> to provide a space for women to come for. My life has been so forged in, in, in pressure and pain that now before I leave, I want to make that count for somebody. Mm -hmm. Not just the spoken word, but now the hands-on work of doing, of doing healing in a sacred space. For, for 30 years, I've been to everybody's church doing healing workshops. And, and when they say, we're having a conference, who can we get to do the, the hard work where, 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 where we, we talk about grief and loss and, and sexual injury? Oh, let's call Copeland, she's the girl. <laughs> I've done that around the country in small spaces and small times, but now as a grandmother, I want to be able to invite the women, particularly we want to heal the women who heal the world. Mm -hmm. So the Women's Wellness Center will be our next space in our venture where we will, we will have nourishing meals and we will have guest lecturers and we will have three days, three day retreats. Uh, and we will, we will not only plumb scripture, but we will also give you a massage and do your pedicure. <laughs> <laughs> and that you come and talk about why you stayed for your husband to beat you up all these years. Mm -hmm. And what, what now can you do to heal your children who witnessed your mishandling. What, what, what are we, let's, 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 
Let's talk about the abortions that you had and you've never been able to grieve them. Let's do that interior work that we have no time to talk about on Sunday morning and you've worn a mask over most of your life. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah said, you, you've, you've healed the hurt of my daughter slightly, mm -hmm. saying peace when there was no peace. Mm -hmm. So in the years that remain, I wanna be able to invite the women be beyond slight healing mm. so, that they, so that they and we can live the rest of our time together as whole women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I am so grateful that the Lord has let me live through these decades and not cause pain to deform me. Mm. That I can still love somebody and still be a loving presence, I hope, and still know that justice cannot be done without real love being the motivation for it. Mm -hmm. And so many of our love places have been so deformed and broken that we cannot fight for justice for anybody else because we've not ourselves been justified, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. to speak. Mm -hmm. So that's where we're going in, in this next season of life. I know I look good, but I'll be looking at 70 in a minute. In just a minute, I'll be looking at 70. <laughs> so in the time that remains, we want to do, because pain is sacred. And often untouchable to people who are afraid to go into those, that holy of holy space. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You've been very open about pain in your life and so talk to us about how you have come to be victorious particularly in terms of how you cared for yourself in the midst of some of that I have been marvelously blessed by women's friendship I've had good brothers brothers who you know in their own ways have loved me and affirmed me and opened doors for me but it was the friendship of women. It was my now probably 30 year relationship. Elaine Flake, Renita Weems, Jessica Ingram, Joanne Browning, myself, Cynthia Hale. Those, it was a posse of six. And through the years, the dyads and triads in, in, our, in our relationship have been one of the most valuable places of self-care. Mm -hmm. Good women friendships that allow me to tell the truth and never look at me differently. That allow me to come from behind the preaching mask. I never had to be great with them. Never had to be in performance mode, but their friendship, their love, their correction, their rebuke, their unwillingness to let me go mm. has been, it has been salvific mm. in this journey in ministry, in, in the midst of our worst times, mm -hmm. in the midst of our most embarrassing times in the times when our business was all over the country, mm -hmm. they were the refuge whereunto I have run. If your, 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 your listeners will remember the book, The Red Tent, I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, and I can't even remember the author, but they, were, they have been the red tent over my life, the, the place whereunto we have retreated time and time again where our, our, our bleeding was staunched and where our tears were dried. And it was not just their friendship, but it was also the intentional scheduled for 20 years, for 20 years, every January, we went away somewhere for a week, the six of us. And this year you got to choose, next year I got to choose. Some, some years we let other women come, invited other women in. And other, next year we said, we'll never invite her again. But <laughs> it was always the place where we could go and, and play. Yeah. 
not just talk about deep stuff, but to play and to swim and to, to have a margarita and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. It was the place of women's friendship that kept me from smoking blunts and drinking Hennessy at night. The <laughs> <laughs> place that kept me in the hard times of my life from cooking grits and putting lye in it and throwing it on my husband, all of that, all of that. Self-care was, was, was given permission by the friendship of those women in my life and a few others that, that chose to love me beyond what I could offer. What would you say about this PhD in preaching program? I would say that where were you when I was just trying to get started? <laughs> <laughs> I am so, I'm inspired by your vision and inspired by the quality of people that have been attracted to this effort. I'm just jealous because I didn't get a chance to be in the process of it. You know, my little, my little D man a hundred years ago, but I, you know, really, um, whatever I can do to um, support it and make it happen, um, tell others about it because you are reproducing uh, the kind of seminal work that will, that will germinate into, I think, the next, the next wave of the church. Mm -hmm. You know, so many of us came, we came, I came from, quote, uneducated clergy who did the very best they could do. Who would have thought that there would not be such a thing mm -hmm. as PhD programming in African American preaching? Mm -hmm. um, um, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of the work that's going to come forth out of these students. And uh, after it's all said and done, I want books from all of them <laughs> <laughs> to be mailed to my address. <laughs> well, that, that's a promise. That is a, that's a promise. Well, thank you for um, the interview. Thank you for your wisdom, uh, for your transparency, for your realness. Thank you for your commitment across the many years to integrity and high quality preaching. And thank you for the gifts that you bear um, to th this generation and the next generation. And most of all, um, for the wisdom and the grace of Dr. Claudette Anderson Copeland. And may I just say thank you to you for being such a great brother. Thank you. Such a fine man of God. Such, such an intentional force for the kingdom. Mm -hmm. thank, you. thank you for your integrity and thank you for blowing a clean wind. <laughs> thank you. I love you very much. Thank you.